What are the benefits of fat burning? We'll get the opinion of the doctor who served as the director and nutrition consultant to the Los Angeles Lakers. She is Dr. Kate Shanahan, a noted speaker throughout the country, who recently joined the Western Connecticut Metal Group. She'll be with us next. Hi, I'm Dr. Eric Mazur. And I'm Dr. Andrea Peterson. We're joined today by Dr. Kate Shanahan, a family physician, but also more a nutritionist who's interested in fat metabolism, has a really interesting perspective, so we're really glad to have you here. Well, I'm excited to be here. Thank you. You want to start off by uh, telling us how you got interested in fat metabolism and nutrition. Yeah, so it was when I was living on Hawaii, Kauai, Hawaii. Uh, I had always wanted to really understand what, what is the difference between people's health? Why are some people so healthy and some people so you know, Hawaii unhealthy? has the longest lifespan of any state in the country. It, it does by like two years, which is leaps and bounds wow. because the, the second uh, in, the, in, in that running there is Minnesota and then behind them, I don't remember, but it's like uh, by two weeks it or It doesn't something. seem fair though. Not only do they have the most beautiful <laughs> place to live, but they live the longest there to enjoy it. That's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a connection because the the what they do is that they are they love the outdoors. They spend time outdoors, and they're gardening, and they're they're hunting, and they're fishing, and they're getting their own food. And I found that that was really the key, that people who source their own food, and then the other key is preparing it according to family time tested recipes, because the people who did that were universally the healthiest as they aged and in many cases they were healthier healthier than their own children and grandchildren which was bizarre to me you know as a doctor where we don't expect to see the 65 year old mm -hmm. being on fewer medications than the you know the teenager and I was gonna ask tell, tell us a little bit more about what you mean by healthier uh, absence of chronic conditions uh, fewer acute problems or all of the above all of the above I mean these people were dynamos they would be so the plantations had just closed and one of the main sources of employment was the hotel industry. So they would be working in the hotels and the housekeeping, which is, that's, that's hard work for somebody in their 60s, right? They're bending, they're lifting up heavy latex mattresses, good quality, nothing but the best there. Um, scrubbing the pots and pans in the kitchens, 14 condos a day, full, full on labor. And then they'd come home and they'd have energy to burn uh, you know, literally, like some of them said, well, then I do my, my exercise video and then I cook for my family. And it was just like, wow, how does someone have so much energy? And then, you know, in the younger generation, that wasn't the case to the extent that I had had conversations with the human resources director who said that it seems like the younger generation just, they just don't have the same, he was saying it was the work ethic. But as a doctor, I was seeing it as their physiology, they just couldn't do it. They weren't as sturdy. And a, a lot of it I tied to the fact that over time, generations of, of you lose the traditional diet, you lose your genetic integrity in your health. Now, so you felt that the diet was driving this additional energy that the, the diet and the way they ate yes. was driving the additional energy that the older people had yes. that, uh, that was not being that. Did they actually, when you spoke to these families, were the younger people eating substantively different than their, differently than their elders? Yeah, they were, uh, you know, because what happens is that the, the traditions, if they're not like valued or if, you know, someone in the family gets, you know, unfortunately, uh, advice from either with the medical system or they just look online, right? And they just like, oh, a healthy diet. Oh, that means no butter, no eggs, no liver, no um, bone stock. That's not important. Um, fermented foods, too much salt, we can't have that. Um, bone broth, also too much salt, not important. And so they stop doing these things and they just go back with the, you know, the standard uh, white bread and uh, bland tasting vegetables and skinless boneless chicken. And the food isn't good, it doesn't satisfy, and then you want dessert. So you develop a sweet tooth and it's all easier and more convenient than growing it yourself, fishing yourself, uh, hunting, all the things that were built into the culture, built into the culture of Hawaii, particularly because until the 70s, not uh, you know, many houses didn't even have refrigeration. So they, I mean, electricity. Right. Now we have a graphic that you, I pulled off your website talking about the different quality fats and oils. Uh, could you go through that with us and why 
some fell into the bad fat and some fell into the good fat? Yeah, so nature does not make bad fats. So on the left side, we'll see the good fats that you'll recognize because not only have you had them probably, hopefully, but you know what they taste like, like olive oil, it tastes like olives, and peanut oil tastes like peanut, butter tastes like butter. But on the opposite end of the spectrum, are the bad fats. Yeah, that's what I eat most of on the right side there. Oh dear. Especially I was very disappointed to see the artificial butter, which I thought was really good for me I on know. the right. It's sad, but you know, uh, it's not just you. It's uh, the, the statistics show that the average American gets somewhere between 30 and as much as 50% of calories from these oils. So they are not insignificant. And so it's things that don't have flavor, canola, cottonseed oil, sunflower oil, corn oil. So, uh, you know, those things don't have a and taste. And what makes the bad, though, in, in, from a nutritional standpoint? I mean, I, I understand one is more natural than the other. I understand there may be some, bio, some molecular differences between them. But what makes them bad in terms of our health? In terms of your health, we're just uh, discovering that they promote something called oxidative stress. And oxidative stress is the reason cigarettes are bad for us. It ages us. It's like liquid age. Or, and um, so when you eat these oils, they affect all of your body with this oxidative stru stress and they accelerate aging, they degenerate your tissues. Cigarette smoking is bad, but cigarettes, you inhale, they affect your lungs, they affect your, um, your arteries in a very negative way and they cause a few cancers. But this stuff is worse because it becomes every part of your body. And so it blocks your fat burn, it causes inflammation, in your skin, you can I can see it when people have who have like psoriasis or eczema. When they get these oils out of their diet, you can see their skin getting clearer. It takes about three to six months. Um, they can feel it because it blocks their fat burn. And if you can't burn fat, you're hungry between meals. You have to eat more, and you don't have energy because fat we store for energy. How do the bad fats block fat metabolism? It, because they, the mitochondria does not burn them because they have uh, something about the bonds. So it's a, there's a certain type of bond called double bond that uh, the energy, the power packs of our cell called the mitochondria um, that produce the energy in our cell, they cannot burn, they cannot process that bond. So it doesn't get burned for energy. And if that is the main source of fat in our diet, then we don't have a lot of energy for these little fellers, these little mitochondrias to produce. They just can't do their job. And in fact, they, they actually damage the mitochondria. They change the mitochondrial engineering. They're, the mitochondria are engineering marvels. If you uh, Google a video of what how they work, there's like a little miniature molecular turbine in there that has to spin. And it's all based on the molecular formulation and it comes from our diet. And if our diet doesn't have the same things that it used to have, it doesn't have the traditional foods that our genes still need, then our mitochondria, don't work, they're not built properly and they can't function normally. And there are scientific studies now that are showing that the diets high in things like corn oil and soy oil, they make people lazy because their cells don't produce energy normally so that when you when you compare like diets uh, high in this stuff versus diets low in this stuff you find that the people who are eating more of it don't exercise and they get fat and they also feel it, it's because they're not exercising that they gain weight it's because they feel hungry that they gain weight and it's really very compelling science that is complicated so you know even physicians don't quite understand it yet and it's contrary to what we've been talking about for 50 years so it's hard for it's hard for doctors like myself to accept that what I learned in medical school wasn't correct it wasn't all the information it wasn't the whole story there's a lot more well I certainly know that a lot of what we thought to be true about cholesterol and diet is no longer considered true that we used to think that a lot of our serum cholesterol, the bad cholesterol, the LDL cholesterol, was driven by what we ate and by reducing eggs and other cholesterol foods that would greatly, and we know that that's only true for a small percentage of the population, perhaps 10 or 15 percent, and most people's cholesterol, we make it. 
Yeah, uh, absolutely. And, and another one I just read yesterday, which was interesting, is I always learned that salt, excessive salt intake was bad. Now there was just a study, and I don't remember, you may have seen it, I've I forgotten it. already where it's Dr. from. Dr. Youssef had a video up on YouTube. And but it, was, it showed that, uh, except for a small, again, a small percentage of people who were very sensitive to salt intake, most of us that had lower mortality with the salt intake substantially above what was re recommended by the whoever recommends the, the feds. So I was, you know, I, I do understand some of the uh, evanescence of nutritional information. It's we really don't understand nutrition. It, we, it, it really is evolving. But but what I guess one of the to challenge you, what makes your uh, structure any more stable over the long term or evidence based than these other ones that uh, have come and gone? And I think you know, we said before. American public feels whipsawed. You know, one day you're told to eat eggs, then don't eat eggs. Uh, don't have processed confusing. sugars, but you know, but it's eat just eat just protein, eat just meat. Don't eat meat. Eat white meat. Eat, don't eat. It, it's very confusing to yes. the average person, and I think it really, really reflects. And let me throw one. Out. Well, let me ask you that. What makes your? Why do you think this idea of natural fats being good and any processed fats being necessarily harmful? They're not just bad, but they're harmful. Uh, why do you think that will have staying power over time as opposed to some of the other ideas that have come and gone? Yeah, it's a very important question because ours is the anti-fad. So we are just trying to codify what was always done for thousands of generations before in the 1950s and 60s when we started looking for the cause of heart attacks. Um, so what I had learned in medical school was that uh, it, that was at that time period where somebody came up with the idea that saturated fat was the cause of the heart attack epidemic that was killing um, you know men in their prime executives right here in New York I think was you know one of the hotbeds uh, in the New York greater New York area or Connecticut um, and so, you know, this, uh, this one gentleman who was a researcher who, um, whose name is Ansel Keys, he had the idea that there was a dietary cause. But the reality is, and now we know this, was that at that time, the number one cause of heart attack de deaths was cigarette smoking. And it didn't have anything to do with diet. But he had ties to the processed food industry, and he was dead set on showing that, um, you know, butter and saturated fat and all the foods that people had been eating for generation after generation, he was dead set on showing that that was the problem. And can, can I just stop you there because we have to take a break, but we'll bring you right back to that point. Uh, doc, I don't even know what the doc, Ansel Keys and his formulation, which I actually remember, not him specifically, but my neighbor was a cardiologist and he, he started having his family avoid eggs, avoid bacon, avoid butter and milk. Uh, and I'm sure it was that influence. So we're going to be back in a couple of minutes, pick up the conversation right where we left off. Don't go away. Hi, we're back with Dr. Kate Shanahan, nutrition expert and physician, which is always fun to have together. <laughs> uh, so we're talking about Ansel Keys and this idea that came out in the 50s about not having uh, satur saturated fats. Was that his primary? Yeah, he was really down on those. And, you know, a lot of folks, to a lot of folks, it feels like, oh, we go back and forth and back and forth. But the fact is, we didn't do that until 1950. Before 1950, it was pretty standard the same kind of traditional food, which we, we talk about, we describe in our book, what is it that all traditional diets have in common, no matter where you are in the world, no matter whether you're Italian or French or Japanese or what. And we felt that was just so essential to understand what that was. So we looked it up. We, we did a lot of research in that department. And, and tell us a little bit more about, so uh, you felt that, uh, that these the fats had a lot to do with that. Yes. Um, and, and, you know, just to get back to some of the things we were talking about before, though, that obviously there was a lot going on in the middle of the 20th century in terms <laughs> yeah. of cigarette smoking and people becoming less active. And, and uh, how do you piece together the relative importance of nutrition with other lifestyle things that are important for people to pay attention to? Yeah, so um, it's a good question. Um, I'd say that it depends on, you know, the, the power of what we've changed. And so cigarette smoking has been, you know, no one would argue now that that is unhealthy. But because um, 
what I've understood uh, and what we mentioned earlier about this thing called oxidative stress, which is like, you know, it is an aging process. Cigarettes are bad because they promote that. But vegetable oils, we consume them. They become our bodies. In massive quantities, we're consuming them now, 30 to 50% of our daily caloric intake. And so, and we have this, you know, while women have it while they're pregnant, they'll quit smoking, but they, they won't quit having deep fried french fries or potato chips and, you know, uh, deep fried chicken and, you know, fast food and stuff like that. Because we don't tell them. Stuff? We don't tell them <laughs> to do that. <laughs> and babies are weaned on, um, instead of getting breast milk, they're getting formula that has these vegetable oils in them. So this is such a powerful, um, it's, it's the most radical change that we have made. For a long time, there have been a sedentary class. For a long time, there has been, um, I just spoke to somebody in India who's, uh, who comes from that caste. And he said that his family was diabetic because his, his father was a doctor. And they were the first to incorporate this new dietary change. And all of his other sedentary family members <coughs> didn't end up getting diabetes. So it's just, you know, that was an anecdotal story. It was powerful to him because he grew up that, with that. But people will say fiber is a big difference. I remember uh, Dennis Burkett. I heard him speak when he was yes. still alive and way back when I was a medical student. Dennis Burkett's famous for a lymphoma named after him, but he, he talked a lot about fiber and colon cancer and how the high fiber diet of the Africans protected them. So uh, how do we know right. if these fats and not fiber or something else, you know, where you're focusing on the fats and the sure. specific, how do we know that? Well, there's a lot of different ways that I could answer that question. We, and I cover like 20 of them in the book. But I think possibly, um, you know, maybe uh, for just now, what I'd like to say is that we did not have these problems. We did not have such an epidemic of obesity, of cancer of yeah, but heart I, attacks. Weren't that just a function of people living longer? We also had an average lifespan of 40 degrees, 40 degrees, 45 uh, years, years or 40 yeah. years. Well, we don't, yes, no, yes and no. So who's living longer now? Because I'm not, I'm only, you know, I'm only 29. <laughs> um, my grandmother is 100, but she was born in 1917. You know, so she was born when they were eating butter, when they were eating eggs. And longevity is not my, my, um, my main proxy for health, actually, because what biology cares about is fertility. And if you look at our fertility, that's drastically declined. Um, and, you know, longevity is a matter largely of luck. You know, no one, if somebody gets struck by lightning when they're 42, no one says, what else is diet? That was bad luck, right? So longevity is not a good proxy. There's too many factors. Well, we do know that Fertility. illnesses, chronic illnesses such as cancer uh, are related to the longer, the, your risk of all of them are related to how long you live. So if you're dying at 45, Correct. you don't live long enough to get colon cancer or uh, lung, lung cancer is probably smoking, but pick yes. another one, pancreas. But we're looking at the age of the incidence and it's creeping down. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, it, you know, it's more common now to have I mean, breast cancer, and there was just an article that showed something about, uh, uh, well, I mean, di children, diabetic, type 2 diabetes is incredibly high. Now we, I, I could go on and talk to you forever, but we have about two minutes left. So for someone who wants to follow this diet, which is not quite the paleo diet, but it's, it's what we used to eat, start. What, what should they do? What should they do? What, how should they be how eating? They what begin? should I have for dinner tonight? The most important meal of the day is breakfast, because breakfast is the most important meal of the day not to screw up. And we do if we eat a meal that's going to block our fat burn. And so the foods that are very high in carb and high in these nasty vegetable oils are the worst kind of foods. So just a traditional like what breakfast. I have for breakfast. <laughs> so, so, to so toast and that spray fake butter would be the worst thing <laughs> right. you can eat, right? So you can have <laughs> one test. slice of toast. But you know you want to have a little bit more more fat, and um, you get your protein later in the day. Breakfast is the best meal to, to focus on really just fat. So a lot of people just have um, well, what I have is I have a coffee with a whole bunch of cream in it and and milk, and it's very high um, high quality. It's it comes from cows that were not fed grain. They were not feedlot cows. They were out in the pasture eating grass, and it's really delicious. And it 
promotes fat burn so efficiently that I don't get hungry. I didn't have lunch today. I never almost have lunch. And I make it all the way till dinner. Because who has time to pack a health, healthy lunch every day? And I get like 45 to an hour of free minutes every day of productivity because I don't have to eat lunch. And then I just go home and somebody um, wonderful has been cooking a delicious, healthy dinner for me. So I just kind of stick with so two meals. Can you again, give us some idea of what a healthy dinner is? Yeah. I so mean, in terms of fat. Dinner we do pretty well with. A nice well pork with. chop? So, uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, you can do, and dinner we do pretty well with. We just don't load up on the starches. So, you know, pasta-based dinner is not so great. If you have just a little bit of pasta and a lot of sauce and a lot of vegetables, um, is that you're going to get plenty of nutrition. Diet? Uh, people talk about the Mediterranean the diet. The Mediterranean diet is actually a traditional diet. And so it is one of the many that we, all, that we have to choose from. We could do Mediterranean, traditional. We could do French, traditional. Well, it's sort of in the Mediterranean area. We could do Japanese, traditional. Sushi, extremely healthy. Fermented foods, that's like kimchi. And um, well, if you're not Asian, uh, more familiar is sauerkraut. Traditionally, uh, fermented sauerkraut is extremely good for you. Um, so you could do like a kielbasa with sauerkraut and some kind of, um, I don't know, steamed vegetable or roasted vegetable or something easy. I like to do one pot um, meals whenever possible. Slow cooked dinners are fantastic. Rotisserie chicken with vegetables. You just want to basically meat and plenty of tasty natural fat, gravy when you can do it. And um, yeah, like the more she talks, the more and I like vegetables. <laughs> That's we have, great unfortunately, advice. we have to break. I'm so sorry to have to cut this off, but thank you, Kate. <laughs> thank you so much. When we come back, we'll answer today's health questions, and we're going to have to have Kate back to tell me what else I can eat, because it all sounds good. <laughs> but right now, let's take a look at some of the upcoming events sponsored by the Western Connecticut Health Network. And this week's health question is, we're going to ask Kate to stay here. As a middle-aged adult, thank you, should I be taking a multivitamin? What do you think of multivitamins? I mean, they, things have sweat. That's another area people, I think, are, are spinning about. Yeah, I, well, what I recommend is kind of a moderate multivitamin, right? Because if you're, so for me, my average caloric needs are 1,500 calories. There's no way I can get 100% of the RDA of all the vitamins. I need some help. And so I just get a multivitamin that has 100% of the RDA of as many vitamins as I possibly can find. And then there's this couple min minerals that I supplement too. I, I've actually gone online and used a tool to figure out my habitual diet, what minerals am I chronically low in? And that's what I supplement to get me up to the 100%. Not, it's, I think we get into trouble when we do these, you know, 3,000%. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and certainly there's been a lot of study, and none of them have been terribly compelling about taking multivitamins. And again, I've- Or I've, even I've, specific I've, vitamins. I sort of, and, and actually vitamin E, uh, which we yeah. all think has been actually antioxidant, the studies looking just at vitamin E have been discouraging. Very They've shown worse outcomes. Well, so. a lot of times, and people don't realize this, it's synthetic vitamin E. And, and so it's an enantiomer, and that means 50% of them are going to potentially oppose the effect of the actual vitamin E because they can bind the receptor, but they don't have the same shape, so they, they don't produce the same action. So again, naturally occurring is, is better. Yes, naturally occurring is better. So you get vitamin E from the natural fats, avocado oil, olive oil, peanut oil. And. Uh, be, the one thing though that calories are very highly concentrated in oil. Yes. I mean, you've got per gram, what is it, twice, two and a half times the number of calories. Doesn't that put you at risk by eating an oil based diet? This is why it's so important to actually be a fat burner because your appetites are normalized. You don't want to eat all the time. And so you can stop eating when you've had enough. And, and that's sort of like a, a skill, a life skill that um, we've generally lost in this country because what we had been focused on was, okay, fats are, too, are bad because they're too concentrated. And so we, if we want to eat a bigger pile of food, we don't want to have fat. But if your goal in life is not to eat big piles of food and to feel good and be healthy, then I would recommend <laughs> not being afraid of actual oils mm. and actual food. 
And you're comfortable on 1,500 calories a day. I am, yeah. I and mean, that's if I don't exercise, that's plenty for me. That's that's what the calculators say I need. Yeah, no. I know if you calculate the caloric requirements way below what I would tend to eat. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, you were going to say something. Uh, just following up the exercise. How important is exercise in fat burning? It's absolutely a fantastic tool. So if when you exercise, your body produces um, hormones that help you burn fat. You, even if you're a bad fat burner at rest, you become a better fat burner the longer you exercise. And I know that we, the effect of that continues beyond when you stop exercising as well. So you, your metabolism is yes. revved up for several hours afterwards in addition to the time you're there on the treadmill or whatever you're doing. Your fat burning is, and so if you, like what the trainers unfortunately will tell you is you've got to eat right away after you exercise but if you do that then you've just all those wonderful fat burning enzymes and everything that you got cranking you just slam them to a halt and you go back you you block your fat burn again so it's good if you exercise to wait at least till you're hungry again and if you can wait an hour or two you really get a lot of fat burning benefits you'll be burning more fat at rest if you sit, you know, if you just don't eat for an hour or two after exercising than you were before you exercised. So let's get, we've got a, a minute and a half left or so. Folks at home want to take your advice and start tomorrow. So you buy your book. By the way, is that available on Amazon and other places? Barnes yeah, it's Noble? available everywhere and also from my website, which is drkate.com. That's okay. Yeah, please plug your website. <laughs> that, that D-R-C-A-T-E dot com? Yes, D-R-C-A-T-E yeah, so no dot This is available there. And uh, and what should people, what, what can I do tomorrow to start being a fat burner? So tomorrow, if you have a, a, a habit of a high carb starchy breakfast, think about what you might enjoy that doesn't have carbs in it. That's you describe not just a cup of coffee with creamy like, cream. So easy. Yeah, <laughs> just uh, plenty of cream. Load up on the cream. Because if you have like uh, four or five uh, tablespoons of it, that's, that's just 250 calories, which is still gonna be less than a bo the average size bowl of cereal. How about eggs? Everybody eats eggs for breakfast? That's fantastic. Eggs with butter, maybe a little bacon, maybe some vegetables for some antioxidants and other vitamins. Um, whatever tastes good. Mm -hmm. Just and, some and toast. <laughs> for, di for dinner, to by things that are natural, you're saying? Uh -huh. Absolutely, natural. If you make it yourself, You've got a, you've got a leg up. <laughs> Great. Okay. Well, thank you so much for being on our show today and uh, and uh, telling us all about. Yes, the it's been it's been a lot research. of fun. And next time I'll bring my boxing gloves and we can go at it. Oh yeah, <laughs> no, lovely. So if you at home might have a question you'd like to ask on Health Talk uh, or would like to, have, to comments about our discussion today, please contact uh, Andrew via Health Talk at wchn.org. We'd like to thank today's guest, Dr. Kate Shanahan, for coming on our show for, uh, and helping us uh, learn more about all your research. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kate. So say, come back next week. <laughs>